It's Kenneth Bailey, and for those of you who've been to all of them, it's great to have you back for the last one. And for those of you for whom this is like the second or third, we love you too. Um, <laughs> and for those of you who it's your first, we love you guys as well. Um, but but welcome. So in 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 sort of closing out this series on um, black aesthetics and the black future, I wanted to have people who really think a lot about the future, particularly the technology, the technological aspect of the future and its relationship to the black community, talk a little bit about where we're going and to talk a little bit about the black state, the black plight as it relates to um, the, the web 2.0 reality. And I couldn't think of two better people than Malia and Fox. Fox Harrell is a, should I say you're a professor at CSEL or like where should I? What, what, what should I give credit to? Yeah, yeah, so Fox is like a professor at MIT at like mad departments. He's like that. In artificial intelligence, he's in comparative media studies, he's at um, writing, science and humanities. What's the name of that one? Yeah, writing and humanistic studies. Exactly. Fox is like in five departments at MIT. Renaissance man. He's a professor like in five departments. He, so when I first met him, he kind of told me he did his degree in performance arts, artificial intelligence. He was an undergrad. Like he's bad. And he's about to talk about critical computing, using computers for social awareness and empowerment. But he's also published this book. What's the name of the book? Uh, well, to come out, it's called Phantasmal Media. It will come out with MIT Press. And he's looking at the black conditions and the, the phantasmagorical imaginary. He's on some other level. <laughs> <laughs> Fox is on some other level. And then Malia's going to blow it up. She's up in here repping. Um, all of y'all know Malia from political work, from organizing. She ran uh, the gathering. She helped get mad people in office. And her work around technology is really, she's really interested in looking at how grassroots organizing and technology merge. And, um, and I'm interested in hearing how she thinks about technology to black community and its relationship to our future. And I, I, and I was incredibly excited to have both of them come at this, this the topic around the media and the black future from different angles and different um, sort of What's the word I'm looking for? Lines of flight, different mm -hmm. points of departure. And with that, I'm going to turn over to Fox, and then we're going to turn it over to Malia. Then we're going to open it up, how we always do. Yeah, yeah first, let me thank uh, Kenny and the organizers for inviting me and having me here. And one of the things I'll talk about is that social activism and uh, using technology for empowerment, that's uh, partly kind of the outreach and, and the activism within the world, but also becoming learners, doers, creators, builders of our own technologies, and also understanding the ways that the technologies themselves build uh, oppressive structures in them. So we'll see a bit of that. So here's, here's what I do. So I direct the Imagination, Computation, and Expression Lab at MIT, and we research and develop Artificial intelligence is a cognitive science-based uh, computing systems for creative expression, cultural analysis, and social change. <coughs> and so today's talk has two different parts to it. So uh, I'll talk about uh, computational identity technologies, that self-imagination, how we imagine ourselves through social networks, online, virtual worlds, through games. And the project I'm running is a National Science Foundation supported called the Advanced Identity Representation Project, or the AIR Project. And then example, ISNAB project for social change that worked with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Liberia. So this is my motivation to start off with. So in the real world, we can creatively represent ourselves in dynamic ways. So we can vary our gesture, our discourse, our posture, our fashion, our life stories, the way we tell our, the way we tell our stories. And all of this is with an astounding sensitivity to social context. Now, computer technologies like computer games, social networking, and virtual worlds are much more primitive than what we do in the real world. And so, you know, Kenny introduced me as the wave of the future, actually. I think the ways that we've learned to negotiate the world, so the experience, the black experience, the ways we've had to adapt strategies for survival, you know, all of that, I think, is much more advanced than what we have here in, in these uh, technologies. Yeah, because these technologies require us to represent ourselves through computational data structures, right, through algorithms, so they have much less nuance than we have in the real world. 
So it raises a few questions for us. So that's how can we serve the human needs for self-expression and identity, and identity construction using the computer? How can we represent ourselves in dynamic ways where we can think about our power relationships with other people in the world, social issues and oppression? Let me give you an example of what the, the problem is. So the people know these games already. Uh, right, so this is uh, World of Warcraft here on, on your left, and this is Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion uh, on the right. So in uh, Elder Scrolls IV, let's consider how it might uh, stigmatize users. So the ostensibly African uh, characters, you could say, in, in, in quotes, are called the Red Guard, and Oblivion are described in the essentialist stereotype of the black athlete. So you read the manual or the instructions, they're the most naturally talented warriors in Tamriel. The Red Guards are also physically blessed with hardy constitutions, quickness of foot. So what this happens, what happens in gameplay terms is it gives you bonuses eventually to your running and jumping abilities. So we can go a bit further, so let's look, look under the hood of the game. And so what this is is a chart of all the default statistics for uh, characters. And so you'll notice things that, that are a bit interesting here. Like if you're an uh, orc and you happen to be female, one thing I should say is you know, most of these games change race, save racial divisions for fictitious races. Like if you're an orc or a troll or an elf. Now this one actually has Nor Norwegian peoples, you know, the Red Guard, which are black people. You have uh, the Bretons, which are the French. So it saves those kind of racial changes uh, that, that are normally fantastic races and applies them to what are ostensibly uh, real races. So if you happen to be a female orc, you'll see here, well, by default, you're 10 points more intelligent than your uh, male counterpart. Right, so if you're a human Breton, which is the, the French group that I mentioned, well, you're 20 points more intelligent by default than your uh, Norwegian or black counterparts. Right, so the choice of race and gender within this game results in ability-based stereotypes. So I published, a, a, I was interviewed for a site, Boing Boing, which is a, a blog, and criticized a number of different games for the limited abilities to represent ourselves. And an interesting ha thing happened, which was that that was reblogged again by a gaming site. So the, the site that, uh, they, the, that uh, the original Boing Boing article was called something like Professor Fox Sorrell and his chimerical avatar have these avatars that change based on what you do, your emotions, and the, the kind of way that you interact within the world. So that when it was reblogged on the site called Kotaku, they actually changed the title to Making Avatars That Aren't White Dudes Is Hard. And so they changed also, <laughs> so it was a kind of reduction. Right? So then they also changed the goal of what I was trying to accomplish. And so they said, you know, Fox Sorrell wants to create avatars that look well, like he does. And so, you know, which also, I like, guess, is a kind of, you know, it's, you know, one is maybe they meant maybe my social category, you know, not just a kind of pure narcissism, right? But, <laughs> but, but, you know, but any, anyway, they spawned a series of incendiary comments uh, about it. So I published another article through that same uh, uh, blog and, and uh, suggested you know, 10 different ways that we can improve our avatar representation and maybe it had an impact because Elder Scrolls V Skyrim so some people might might know that uh, this is the new default red guard <laughs> character <laughs> if you create if you, if you play that game this is what the character looks like now uh, and you know, the interesting thing though is that my critique <laughs> uh, uh, the other art the article had a big picture of my face and <laughs> beginning of it with along with a with a avatar so it was a bit Interesting. Maybe they responded to the article, but the thing is, you know, regardless of how the character looks, it still is going to be 20 points less intelligent than your French uh, counterpart. So.